you know, prepared. Stuff and stuff. Stuff and stuff. Okay. Stuff so Lucas, so, Lucas uh, connects me to these rando people, Chris. Okay. I, I, I wanna, appreciate I it. I don't know how you would, uh, <laughs> how would you, <laughs> I'm not implying you, but yes, very much you. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> I want, I want to I want to to tell me how you you would handle this. He connects me with these rando people, and I say a lot of stuff on the internet. Uh, I get on the internet and just talk, right? And uh, some of my opinions sometimes get a little spicy, right? Now they are always from the heart, and I have uh, very grounded beliefs in uh, with certain things, and uh, not everything, but like there are like three or four things that I'm just like a hundred percent a rock solid, like. These don't change f- with me because they're they're grounded in what I believe to be absolute truth. Okay, and I get these randos like he he connects me to these randos and they're like, hey, why are you saying this about this? Now, if I get into it, I am going to tell them that their religious beliefs are bunk, <laughs> that what they believe to be true about God is a complete and total farce. And that they have built built their business and their identity around lies, okay? Now, I have everything to back it up. Now, I could get into it and I'd be like, here, I'm going to lay everything out to you. And I believe, and I understand that I am going to rock your world, that everything you believe to be true will be a lie. And I, I had to deal with this exact same thing. I had to face the exact same reality. But guess what I did? I changed because I had to. I saw the evidence in front of me and I could not. I could not just walk away from that information and say, "Yeah, it's fine." I, the cognitive dissonance was not going to be acceptable to me. All right, I just said, "No, this, I have to go with this. I have to go with this. I can't." Now, most people don't do that. I have found that ninety nine per nine nine percent of people that I introduce stuff to uh, just go, "Yeah, it's fine." And then they go on living their lives because they don't want to change. They realize that this has all these implications and it's going to require them to completely up in their lives and they don't want to do that. And I get it. I get it. But he connects me with these people and they ask me, they're like, hey, why are you saying this? Like, what, do I, what do I do? I, I can't tell them. Like if I tell them, like I said, it's going to upend everything. They're going to get mad at me. I don't they care that they get mad at me. No, no, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I, I don't care that they get mad at me. That that part is whatever. But at the same time, that like the it's the it's the ah David thinks he knows everything about this that and yeah. It's like okay, well, I don't think you understand how much I've looked into these things. Like you have no idea. But trust me when I tell you that I've spent years and years and years and years digging into this, and that's why I'm telling you that what you believe to be true is a lie, a farce, and completely wrong, and here's why. And therefore, your business is built on a lie. It is selling a lie, and it is so egregious because it's selling a lie on the backs of religiosity. Religiosity. Did I, what? Did I get that out? I was, I was a little, a little what? to get that out there. Religiosity. <laughs> What the heck is happening now? Like this is like this is like David's soliloquy on life and whatever else. I guess this is like no, no, I want I want to know what you wake do. up to dogmatic what, 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 David, right? Right. Like I'm just here watching. I'm just eye candy at this point. I feel like what, I should have. What do you tell a, somebody? What do you tell somebody? Uh, you just you just show them all the ways they've been screwing up, right? Like it's uh, it's it's fixing it's fixing it's fixing misguided belief systems. And that's how I came to be here. Like I listened to the podcast you did where you were besmirching Tyre's reputation and I sent Lucas a message. Yeah. Um, Tyre's. Yeah. Um, And I was going to go back and listen to that podcast again and write down all the things you said. You listened to wrong. And (laughs) you listened to uh, wrong. (laughs) Maybe, maybe I was not in the right headspace, but anyway, um, so I was like, "Hey, I, I texted Lucas and was like, "Hey, let's let's do one on tires and whatever." And it seems to me like this, we may be more whatever than tires, but it's fine, right? So we, you know, you start and you let it go. But um, uh, I do have to know what what was wrong with this tire argument. I, I got to hear it from you. 
I, honestly, I, mean, I don't remember. Like I said, I just say things on the internet. I don't know. Well, so, so people are going to have to go back and listen to this and I'd be, I could be completely wrong, but the, the general feel I got was that you didn't like to sell tires or wasn't enough margin in it. Um, and then maybe we didn't know the process for some of it and anything done correct makes money. And when you're looking at like gross profit per hour, um, pardon my French, you can make a shit ton of money in the tire industry yeah. if you if, if it's done correctly. Now, there are a lot of people that don't do it correctly. Sure. Um, and I, that, that couldn't have been me because I talk about discount tire all the time. Discount tire makes all of their money just banging out tires. And they have such low margins, they're selling them for nothing. They're buying them for nothing, but they're selling them for nothing. Right. And they're set up for speed. So if you're well, banging out tires in 40 minutes, over and over and over again. Yeah. I mean, you're going to make a ton right. of money. And I heard that. I remember that. Yeah. But my thing or my rebuttal to that is like, great, let discount tires sell their tires. But there's no reason that we can't sell tires as well and make money on it and keep them in house. Um, and I will tell you, if you are in a program, a tire program, and you're working it properly, you can make as much margin or more and sell the, the tires for the same price discount tire does and keep all those customers in house. Um, as long as you're, as long as you make a margin on the tire, you have a road hazard program and you're using the backside money. Like you can make a, a ton of money. Um, what what I would push back on you on that is, is that assumes you're selling or have the opportunity to sell X amount of tires because a lot of these programs require certain amount of tires to be sold. And if I'm not selling that many tires, we, we sell a lot of tires Right. what okay. we do. Right. Now, I sell tires. I quote tires out on every vehicle that comes in. We follow the 300% rule. So if the car comes in, needs tires, we quote tires out. And I tell the customers, I'm like, look, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to sell a Michelin at what Walmart sells Michelins for. Right. Walmart it's has not, the, it's flavor, not the same it's tire. Not the same, yeah. yeah. It's not the same Michelin. They have their own flavor. Same thing with Costco and right. the, the, Forever tire rotation, I tell them, you're, you've got kids doing it that don't know how to do anything other than ugga dugga the wheel off and ugga dugga the wheel back on, and they have to do it as fast as possible because they're doing it for free, and they really just want you to come back in three or four times a year so they can sell you more tires. Like That's the only reason why they're doing it. And, and I tell the customers all this, and they still, I would only, I sell maybe 20% of the tire that I quote. And it's not a price thing. A lot of times it's, it's uh, yeah, but I already get my oil change done at Costco and they're going to do my tires and I get this great discount and they're going to put Michelins on for less than what you're selling your mid-tier Kumos for. And I get that. I don't have a problem with that. And I tell them, look, if you want, if you're going to compare a Kumo to a Kumo, not that I would sell a Kumo, let's say Toyo. If you're going to compare a Toyo to a Toyo, I'm going to be very competitive in my price. And I market certain percentage on the GP. I get my full labor in there, full labor. We eat the road hazard. Like I make enough on tire. Like it's whatever. Like a continental comes with road hazard. And so we're right. in the continental program. It's, it's 400, uh, 400 tires a year, right? Is what it works out to a hundred a quarter. Continental. And, mm-hmm. Even though like a mid tier tire too. Will that count? Uh, I yeah. have a lot of, I have a lot of Euro shops that sell a ton of continental as OE equipment and everything else. Um, if you're a Euro shop, it makes sense. That makes right. 100%. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a pin in this right here. So the road hazard, road hazard is great as far as far as what they're selling. Um, but there's also a way to go above and beyond because most of those programs are confusing. They prorate them. You have to charge for mounting and balancing again, and all that other stuff. I'm right. talking about. I'm talking about next level service and value for your customers. And I don't want all your customers to buy. Actually, I do want all your customers to buy tires from you, but um, some of them are not just because they want to go to discount tire. And that's great. Let them go to discount tire. But the other people that want to do it and stay fine. Um, And so those are the ones that I'm talking about. And so when we talk about road hazard, um, the way I've always done it, the way we did it. And so you know, when I had my shop 12 years ago, we used to sell $100,000 a year in road hazard and our adjustment cost was 6% every year. Like, like it, it never fluctuated 
lower than 5.8%, never above 6.5%. So you figure $100,000 in your cost is $6,800 for the year, $6,500 for the year. Um, so we did our, so, we did, we did our own in-house road hazard program. Um, explain, but go ahead. Break that down a little bit, right? Because there's okay. a lot of people and, and, and this is something that I started learning. He's selling when, it for a hundred thousand dollars. It's cost him $6,800. I, I know that. Okay. What are we explaining? <laughs> I, so when, when we merged ASTA, it was IGONC and it was the North Carolina Tire Dealers Association. Yeah. There was so much that I learned about the tire business and so much that I picked up and took away and said, oh man, I've not been utilizing this. And this is a moneymaker, right? Not right. only a moneymaker, but it keeps clients in-house. Explain a little bit about the basics of setting this program up in-house because okay. inevitably, like people don't ask David intelligent questions. He's the smart one of the two of us, <laughs> but they don't ask him questions because he seems intimidating. So they're going to send me messages and they're like, hey, how do I set up a road hazard? I have no clue what I'm talking about. I'm just right. talking some cockamamie that doesn't make sense about anything. The, right. so, the only thing the the setting up is, hey, we have it now. The, the right. problem is the terms and conditions because you want to have right. the ironclad yes. terms and conditions. Yeah. And so, oh, so, so let me back up just a second. So there used to be a company called Sancio which you used to go through and buy like a roll of stamps and they charge you like $4 a stamp and you had to put the stamps on the invoices and then you had to call them and do all this stuff. And half the time the customer was still sitting there when all the work was done because you had to cut DOTs out of the tire. So that was a pain point for us in our shop. And I see all these customers pissed off because it's taken time. Sometimes they paid just as much or more the second time because it's been prorated, all that. So I wanted to eliminate all of that from, from everything. So it's a real simple one stage p statement. Um, and again, so you set it up to believe what you want to believe. So for us, a tire's worn out at 430 seconds or less. Okay. So, so anything between the tread you roll out on and 430 seconds, We'll replace the tire free of charge, no prorating, no mounting or balancing. All you do is pay the road hazard on the one new tire you're getting. So if it was $100, you pay $15 for the new road hazard on that one tire, and then boom, you're done. Now, in your, I mean, and that's basically it. You're, if you wanted to get as crazy as enter, in, entering a cost of goods sold and a sale line, in your income statement for road hazard, you can. Um, I just put it all in the tire price and the tire cost. Now that way, I that way I know exactly how much I made on the tires. Um, and, so and, what, oh, but you're making, going, are you making some kind of stipulation that hey, I need to see you at least every ten thousand miles for a tire rotation. I need to see you every ten thousand miles for an alignment because so, these people are going to shred through their tires. So because they're not rotating them and they're sitting on a front wheel drive car that's got an well, 80 20 split on weight or whatever. That's not that's not a road hazard, that's customer neglect. So okay, okay, if okay. if if a customer rolls in and they've got a flat and you see it all wiped out because diagonal wipeout whatever for the alignment then you're like, "Hey, these things are worn out, but it's not a road hazard." Um the other thing is, is like most of the time we're going to take care of our customers no matter what, and we'll figure it out. But I'm telling you, the sales are so much and the the replacement costs are so little typically that it's well worth it to do it, do it in-house. Now, if you get some sort of a coverage on the backside from your manufacturer, then you keep those tires, you do it in-house and you send them to them so they can give you credit back and you make the money off that as well. Like, like use the program to your advantage um, so the other thing is free flat repairs for the lifetime of the tires. We did that. Um, the way we did tire sales and the way I tell my shops now is regardless if they get the road hazard or not, you still get a free rotating balance every six months or 6,000 miles. That's included in the purchase of the tires because I still want them coming back in. Um, and, and okay, so I see the wheels turning, so I'll stop and answer questions. So so my, my two questions are, is, yep. is situations I've ran into over the last two months, yep. right? All wheel drive vehicles, less than two thirty seconds of tread variance, right? Okay. Now, all of a sudden I'm road hazard, but they expect me to replace or mill down one of these tires, right? So that, that's one challenge. Do the you other challenge down, is that a thing? Yeah. There's a place down the road that does it and, and insurance <laughs> the requires they it. using it. 
Right. What? Well, yeah, I get it, but that makes sense because you have to have they have to be even or whatever. We tell the customers like, "Hey, you have to replace right. them all now." Yeah. Well, insurance won't do that, and there's a lot of people like if you're doing road hazard, that's kind of like the standard practice. The right. other question though is that you know just a while back, and and Continental seems like to be a, a decent brand. Um, they offer this nationwide coverage on their tires that has road hazard and all this other stuff. I couldn't get anybody to cover it. I called the I called another shop, set it up, and explained like, "Hey, dude, here's what's going on. Even if I have to pay out of pocket, I'll pay out of pocket to take care of my client." And they didn't do it. And and I so I call and talk to Continental, and they're like, "Yeah, nobody does tire warranties. Like, no, nobody's going <laughs> to accept this. So like, you just you probably just need to write them a check, and we'll reimburse you or something. But yeah. but how do you navigate that if so if your client's out of town or? So you're going to have to remind me what the first question was because we'll have to go back to it. So on this, what we tell and what we state in the policy is just you pay the, you pay for the flat repair, bring us the receipt, and we'll reimburse you. If you have a damaged tire, um, if you can't pay for it, let us know. We'll pay for it credit card over the phone. If you can pay for it, pay for it, bring it back. We'll reimburse you for it. And out of all the road hazards we sold, in the eight, 10 years we had that shop, it happened twice. Like we had two yeah. people that one had a flat repair and one I think blew out a tire on the road. That was that was it. Um, and then two, you can put a stipulation within 25 miles. It has to come back to us. Like you can write your road hazard p- policy to be whatever you want it to be, whatever you believe in. Um, and, th- and then so that goes back to the original question, I think. Um, if you believe that you can't have these variances in the tires, then you need to put some sort of a clause or inclusion in there that, you know, if you're down to 630 seconds and you ruin a tire, we're going to pay to replace the one, but you need to pay to replace the other one or, or, or whatever. Like people get, people get too tied up in all the things that keep them from implementing policies right this instead of making it easier for the customer and everybody else and then doing it. Yeah. Um, I I think it's not, it's not a, it's not a, a fear of what if it's not that it's the, the, customer is expecting x so i need to over communicate up front right so we don't have a miscommunication on the backside. so right. on, on a vehicle that requires only a 230 seconds variance from any uh, of the tires that's a vehicle where i'm going to stop and say hey we looked this up just let you know that we're going to be able to cover your tire the one tire but when these things get down to 830 seconds or under at 7.30 seconds, it's great that you have essentially three good tires that you could right. drive for another two or three years out of, but you're going to have to replace them all. Sorry. Right. That's just the, the vehicle that you own. So sorry. So sad. Get a Toyota. Right. So, I mean, there's always to handle it. You know, the other thing is if you want to, if you do any used tires at all, Offer them twenty bucks a piece of tire on trade ins or yeah, something, tire, but that's yeah. that's tires can get you I mean, into the sun. Yeah, that is the sketchiest. I don't know how right. many people do it. I don't know either, but there are people like there are people on like all kinds of corners in America that do that for yeah. cash and and probably make mo- more money than all of us combined. Right? Because <laughs> right. well, everything's everything's for cash. In, everything's for cash. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I only made ten thousand dollars last year. Yeah. Yeah, wink, just the wink, wink. just the old guy sitting there. But so what I would say is if you're not doing it, do it. And here's the other thing. I'm shifting gears on you. If you want to come back, we can. I can go into any parking lot in America. I've done this for years and do a tire safety check. And 33% of those tires will need to be done by yeah. tread depth, um, improper alignment, or dot codes. So I just I do a lot of on-site um uh, visits with some of my shops and and they're like, oh, we're only selling 10 tires a week. And I do the math on it and I'm like, okay, you're selling 10 tires a week, but you do 60 cars a week. So 60 times four is 240 times 0.33 is 80 tires a week you should be selling. Now at some point, depending on what your new mix of people is, that number is going to come down because you've sold everybody tires. But I tell them, I'm going to come do an onsite and I'm going to walk by every car and I'm going to punch you in the throat for every time I see a car that should be written up on an inspection that's not because we're skipping that part of the inspection. And I, j- I just did one a couple of weeks ago. Who's skipping and- inspections? Oh, Who's dude, every, skipping inspections? Every, every shop in America except for yours, apparently. How do you um, make money? Look, I miss an inspection. I don't make any money. 
you know how tight things are. I don't have any money right now, and I gotta, I gotta, I have to inspect these cars. I'm flooded with cars right now. It was just great because we've been slow for two weeks. I have to inspect the cars, and we don't make any money otherwise. Like, how do you make any money without the inspection? Well, what a lot shop of shop is operating without inspect. I want to meet these people. How are you paying your them. bills? Let's let's go out in public and we'll shake hands and I'll I can show you. Oh, well, yeah. they have an inspection. It's marked green, but then I walk by and I'm like, that is not green, bro. That, those so are baloney skins. Yeah, those are all red. And here's another one that gets me. Um, I was in a shop in California, big heavy duty diesel shop. They had a t- they had a job up there. They were doing like forty eight hundred dollars worth of work on this diesel truck. And I walk by and there's a nail in the tire. And so I go back yeah, up front. Fix that. Just fix I that. I go up and I asked him. I I asked the guy. I said, "Show me the inspection." He's, "Oh, it was in here two weeks ago. That's when we wrote up all this work. We didn't do an inspection." No, I'm, like, come. No. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, come here. Come with me. And I go look. I go. This is a fleet guy that has to have his truck. He scheduled it out for forty eight hundred dollars worth of work, and now he's going to go out and have a flat in two days. And it's our fault. Like I don't yeah, care if you sell it to him or whatever, but it needs to be fixed. It can't go out of here like that. Yeah, yeah. no, no, that you're 100 percent right. If two weeks in, I'm not reinspecting the car because that's he's oh, I, back listen, in for what listen, I, sold I learned weeks. that lesson. I learned yeah, that. Lesson. Me I'm too. Eating, I'm eating the flat. No, right, yeah. no, 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 no. It's beyond that. It's beyond that. I, years ago, I, my initial business coach kept saying, "Like, hey, you have to do a cursory evaluation when it comes back. You got to check the things because the the problem is, is you might see a vehicle that comes back and you keep seeing a history of it having a, a cursory evaluation or, or that it was in here recently. So you keep skipping your full evaluation on the car, and nobody's checking it." And so situation being that it comes back in and nobody's checked it for four visits because it had, it had been here so many times. They just thought everybody else did it. It wasn't documented in shopware that you had to click the button off. And so nobody had checked the F and all. And guess what? It, guess, guess who it cost? Yeah, that's right. It cost me because it had been in the shop four different times. And they kept saying, well, we thought you were taking care of the car. We thought you were maintaining the car. We thought this was right. And so that car can come back to you. And, and you can have a brake line bust that you that wasn't busted before. You can have low oil cars with low tension oil rings are burning oil so fast that it's low on oil by the yeah, time it yeah. comes back around in two weeks. Okay, then we're talking about like I'm talking like a, a full inspection by a no. I don't do the full inspection. Fluid, I do what's called a cursory. Checks. We we do fluid checks on every car. Every is it documented time. that you have to do it? Is it documented that we have? In other to words, do it? is there an evaluation on shopware that they have to click off on saying they checked it? No, we don't. So we okay. Yeah, I, I have I one of those that. because I learned that lesson. Was everybody yeah. thought everybody else had done it and nobody had the, done the, it. The last in, in on our shop, the policy is the very last person that touches the vehicle is is typically one of the two service advisors. And one of the two service advisors, the last thing they have to do is check fluids, check the oil, top off the coolant, the the fluid, make sure the, the maintenance light got reset. Make sure the vehicle's clean. Like that's their checklist or whatever. I don't have it documented. It's just five things. Just do the same. If five it's things. if it's not documented, it never happened. Yeah. First of all. Second of all, if you have to go to court to defend it's yourself, that you have to do it. <laughs> it um, if you have to go to court to defend yourself three years from now, and everybody that works there during that time that worked on the vehicle is no longer there, and you're the one that has to go into court. What document? Documentation. Yeah. What document? What record do you go to to look at and be like, "Excuse me, sir. Um, excuse me, Your Honor. This is this is our process. This is what we do." And then you look and you hand it to them, and they're like, "Well, you didn't do it in this case." And we're like, "Well, we do it all the rest of the time, you know." But please, fine, please fine, don't. Fine. I'll so, put it on there. Whatever. I'll put it on there. I. You know, it, it's final funny. checks. I, Check. The I watched. Oil. I watched a. Um, I watched a video this weekend. It was a court case. And and I've I've been watching a lot that involved the automotive <laughs> Wait a world. Of all, all the other stuff you go you got going on, you had time to do this. But I'm just going to yeah, say that. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. It, all right. It was it was 11 o'clock at night. I was I was tired of watching the fan spin in a circle. So I'm sitting there watching this court case, okay. and it's about a warranty, right? It's an extended warranty. 
And and so the the judge goes in and she's talking about this warranty case. And they said, well, but they told us it was 100,000 miles. They told us this. They told us that. And and look, one of my biggest beefs with these warranty companies and with these car dealerships is they're selling warranties and they're selling them as a 100,000 mile or 60,000 mile warranty and they're charging the full price for them, but the consumer doesn't understand that warranty does nothing until the manufacturer warranty expires. And so their warranty was shorter than the manufacturer warranty, what they had sold the client. And so as as the judge works through this now, she sided in some ways with the plaintiff. She gave them their $2,000 back. They paid for the warranty. But because this dealership had documented everything on paper and, and they said the guy, they've got a video of the guy clearly admitting like, hey, this is, this is wrong. We made a mistake. We didn't give you the right warranty coverage and it, it's not correct. The judge said, but the problem is. You signed this piece of paper right here, and it says that this was the coverage. Now, I get that's not what you thought you were getting, and it doesn't make any sense to pay $2,000 for 700 miles of coverage on your car, but the point is you signed it, right? And so that really opened my eyes to something that is, hey, we're getting these signatures on these repair orders, and they're seeing this documentation sent to them, and when they pay with a credit card, they have to sign off on it. And that is the proof to the judge that, hey, we showed them this. Yet we see so many shops that are skipping that process. You see so many shops that are taking it out. And, and you know, when, when I was first talking to Carolyn, uh, or Carolyn years back, and, and she was showing me how shopware was supposed to work, she said, Lucas, you don't, you don't decline the jobs unless you absolutely have to. You, the client needs to do that. And yep. I'm like, but why? And she said, because if you ever have to go to court, it documents they said no, not you. And it wasn't a, a conversation of, did you tell them they shouldn't? It was, they said no to it. And so that's why we document the way we do to prevent that. So every invoice is a legal document. And yeah. if you don't have it filled out properly to defend yourself, then you're just hosed. I, you know, I see it all the time. No, no in mileage, no out mileage, um, just the customer's name, none of the rest of the information. And I know David doesn't do it this way, but 90% the anxiety. You're giving me anxiety. How do you, 90, where do you find these shops? Where do you find these shops? Everywhere. I don't understand. Every, every street corner in America, like 90% of the shops yeah. out there, if I do an RO audit, half of those tickets are going to be incorrect in one way or another. Yeah. Um, and then so in one of my peer groups, we did we do, we do a group repair order audit um, every other meeting, and we were going through doing it, and one of the owners was like, crap. I know for a fact that we overcharged this customer because we 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 thought we needed this one part, but we didn't, and some yeah. nobody took it off there and whatever. So RO audits can be good, RO audits can be bad, but um, you know somebody has to watch the the employees, right? Like there's yes. got to be there's got to be somebody watching this stuff, um, Man, dude. I'm telling you, and I I hate doing RO audits, right? <laughs> Especially like the digital deal because. Now I'm having yeah. to click uh, through yeah. and move and adjust and go back right. and forth. And so that sucks. But but I'm going to tell you, I know that mine are not where they're supposed to be right now. Right. And and my guys do a really good job and they're trying really hard to get it right. But I know there's some things that I've not trained my new staff on that, hey, this is how this has to be. And, right. and the number of situations where we see and, – and the the argument that keeps coming up is just like unbelievable to me. Well, if I don't put it on there – there's no way the judge is going to side with them. <laughs> no, that's not how this works. Right. If you don't document it at all, the judge is definitely going to side with them because you have no legal recourse. You have no documentation. And, and you know, even so far as putting in notes about the conversation with the client, I tell my service advisors, if you get into a tricky situation with a client, document what they said and what you said to them. So that way it's on there. Even though our calls are recorded, even though everything's documented, at least you can indicate, hey, I was a little concerned about this, so I put on there what we were discussing. And and I'm telling you, these shops that are saying, oh, no, man, you don't want to put it on there because that opens you up to liability. Use tires, right? Oh, no, if I if I don't put it on, give them an invoice, and if I just take cash, there's no proof it was me. Oh, buddy, that is not the world we live in anymore. Yeah, no. They will come after you. Right. Um. It- and so we can keep going on this, but also not to completely abandon the tire thing. David earlier said uh, about Michelin's about, you know, being competitive and whatever else. Uh, I had a shop in the Florida Keys 
one day he, the owner had a shop in West Palm Beach. He's like, hey, Chris, I think I would like to retire to the Florida Keys, but I want to buy a shop so I can work a couple days a week um, and then fish the rest of the time. And so um, the magic of computer, I looked and there's this little shop in Marathon, Florida. We bought for $65,000, no real estate, of course. Um, and we sold that shop to Tire Kingdom five years later for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, plus all the money we made in between. So we ended up going from like three hundred thousand dollars a year in sales to over two million dollars a year in less than five five years. But he sold enough Michelin tires, and he was on the program that for every Michelin he sold, he got twenty five dollars back from Michelin. So every set of every set of four tires, he got a hundred bucks back, and all that went into his pocket because. Um, they did some of that on like a, like a visa debit card. And so the owner and his wife ate, ate out every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's the card they yeah. used. Um, so, and I know that's a lot of tires, but also the reason we got bought out by tire kingdom is tire kingdoms. Like how in the hell are you guys selling all these tires? Cause they're seeing, you know, Michelin and them are seeing everybody else's numbers and they know what we're buying and everything. So they just walked in one day and was like, Hey, we want to buy you out. Um, anyway, so the backside money is huge. Um, co-op, co-op funding, everything else. So, you know, you can, you can sell done correctly. You can sell a thousand dollar tire ticket. If it's got tires, road hazard alignment on there and make 500 plus dollars on that, make and and do it in less than two hours. Um, so your gross profit per hour, it helps bump that number up as well. Um, the other thing, sorry, I bounce around a lot. It's my ADD, ADHD, whatever. This is where my brain takes me. Um, Lucas, you'd mentioned about deferred work. We see a lot of stuff or declined work. We see a lot of shops where the service advisors go in after it's been declined and delete it out. I know, uh, right? What's the, what's the point? Like, how they're, do we... They're trying, I know, they're trying where to improve are you their close ratios. Shops? They're everywhere, David. They're everywhere, I tell you. Um <laughs> I don't know if they're purposely trying to make their numbers look better or whatever, but if you look at like tech metric shopware, whoever, you know, your, your closing ratio, it changes. But then if you do follow ups, like, what are you following up on? Like I, yeah. I get a lot, I get a lot of shops in tech metric. It says we presented 250 hours this week and we sold 250 hours. Well, great. What about the 750 you didn't sell because you're, slap dicking around and you're not doing your job and then so you just like delete it out and make yourself look yeah. better that's a red I, I mean, flag um, i don't how does yeah. the shop oh, yeah. owner not see that as a red flag that's because they they're, 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 they're not because yeah. they're not looking they're not yeah. looking and 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 you know i i think part These of the, are issue the same with that shop is. owners that are posting that garbage on the internet they're like we could do a week and they yeah. screenshot their we have a, shop, we have a we have a hundred percent yeah. Close ratio. Yeah. The one yeah. I use. yeah. Like, look at our close ratio is 99%. It's like, what are you doing? What are if, you talking if, about? If I was allowed in those forums, I could be like, dude, you're 100% you're, you're faking that. There's only one recognized forum. You're on the podcast. There's only one. The rest of them can go to hell. I'm I don't saying, know if I'm, <laughs> I don't know if I'm in your forum or not, but here's the are, other thing. You're hundred percent. You're on there. And Lucas will argue with them. He's like, what do you mean? You're at 88% close ratio. There's no way. And they're like, yeah, we're just really good at sales. We have great customers. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, Dude, you're not doing a good, ins- yeah. yes, you're yeah, not doing exactly. a good enough inspection. You're fudging the numbers. I don't know why you would as a shop owner intentionally delete Elite recommendations out. Oh, it's, that it's seems scary, insane dude. It's to me. Scary. That's sick. It's, um, and so I'm gonna have to look at that because I don't ever see any of your stuff on my Facebook feed at all. Um, you don't like share and comment. <laughs> well, you know what? Half, half the time, half the time, I get you know I get up at four thirty in the morning and I see dumb shit on the internet and i start typing i start typing a couple of paragraphs in and i'm like you know what what's the point and just yes. delete it all out yep. and just stop yep. so hey so i if you i don't wake say up, if you want to wake up like really fast you open up facebook and you look for something political some something to oh. set you off on because you just want to read it and go and then your head is like oh, oh man i'm gonna and then you stop now you don't comment Man, actually that will wake you up you're like you know what? i'm ready to go let's do this i think the la- i think the last time i commented on one um the guy got on there and he's like well what do all these coaches know blah 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 and i kind of defended myself a little bit 
And I'm like, well, if you're not worried about the coaches too much, I can put a shop right across from the street from you and we'll see what happens. Cause I'm not afraid to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so well, neither here nor there. Look, uh, here's the deal is that the, the people that are posting this in the groups, right? This is an ego thing for them. And this is about right. being the best. This is about winning. It's not about being successful. It's not about doing it the right way. It's not about helping the shop down the street or the shop across the country. It's all ego. And, and the, the hope behind the groups was is that we would bring them information so they could see it in a different light, that, that it might help one of those if they ever had to go to court. It might help avoid that situation, right? It right. At least give them the information they need, whatever it may be. And, and unfortunately, you know, those that are in the group that, that kind of take it the other direction, you have no choice, but you just have to ship them out, right? That they can't stay there because they're, it's never going to be productive conversation. Well, yeah, half those people shouldn't, I mean, they shouldn't be commenting on anybody else's stuff. Um, and this is, this is a, a, an interesting thing in the industry. We have, mm, I don't know. I could blame it on other coaching companies. I got one in mind. Like the big thing is, is to buy as many shops as you can yep. and blah, blah, blah. Show everybody how great you are and do all this where half of those people can't run the shop they have. They don't need slash deserve a second one. Um, and we get a lot of clients that are like, hey, Chris, my 20 group, my, my other coaching company convinced me to buy this shop and I'm just tanking. I'm getting my teeth kicked in. Yeah. Um, what do we do about that? And I'm like, well, you know, th- we got to get started. We got to figure it out. Um, but, you know, some people, they just don't need a second shop or third shop or fourth shop For or sure. whatever. Absolutely. And I think and, a lot of them are getting sold the idea of you're like, yeah. Hey, you're making whatever, $250,000 a year out of this one shop. You can right. be making half a million. If you just opened another shop or bought this other shop out and then, you know, our system, just implement our system. And it's like, yeah, great. So you've got this nice little shop. It's humming. It, you're barely doing any work and your staff's right. handling everything. Why would you run out and go buy right. another and create more work for yourself? Yeah. Why? Yeah. I to mean, what end? yeah, we have shops that are doing two million a year, net and 35% and the owner's never there. Why? Like why, why, yeah, why, sure. unless, unless you're just a glutton for punishment and don't know what to do, why would you put yourself back yeah. in? And here's the other thing. We see a lot of them getting in trouble. They buy another shop. And then they, they just leave it be like what I tell shop owners is if you can't walk out of your first shop and go to your second shop and spend every day there for six months, you got no yeah. business doing a second shop because you're going to have to do um, all your processes, procedures, everything else. Make sure that they're taken the way you want them. And a lot and of them are like different. They're yeah. They're going to be the same. Yeah. Because every shop's different. Yeah. So anyway. 100%. No, no. Yeah. Like you walk into my, well, you can you can keep like ninety five percent of it the same yeah. across two shops, three I, shops, four shops. It, it What's going to be different is the people you put in there. The right. problem is like, hey, are you really really good at hiring techs? Can you no, find techs when no dude. one else can? Do you yeah. have a like a giant stack of applications of fantastic technicians and service advisors like ready to go right now? No? Then what the hell are you doing buying another shop? Because that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to flip and staff it or be the only person there working. Right. It, it, it was a rude awakening going to 10 base. Right, it, because there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work in ten bays that worked in three bays. Right, and there's a lot of stuff that works in ten bays that won't work in three bays. And so finding that balance has been tough for me. And and you know one of the things that um, Doug said when we were interviewing him is he said, look, you know the first three maybe four stores is miserable because you don't have enough money to pay that person to take that operations manager role to handle some of that bigger stuff that you don't need to be trying to do. And that's one of the things I see these guys going out and starting multiple shops. And and there's a couple um, that I've spoken with locally that went out and they started five and six shops. They had no system. They had no process. They had no nothing. It was just, oh, I want to own five shops. I'm going to be the biggest right. in town. I'm going to, you know, and and there, there was a chain around here that was a tire store, and the, the man did an amazing job of building a huge organization, sold it for a buku of money, and he just did a fantastic job. But it wasn't I went out and bought 25 stores overnight. 
It right. was that, okay, let's build the system and let's have the system in place. And now we have people who are endeared to us and employees who love what we do. And I need to create opportunity for them to grow into something bigger. And so here's how we're going to do this. I have the opportunity. I have the operating capital. I have all of these things in place. But they didn't just jump right in and say, I'm going to do this. And right. that, that's what that's what I don't like when I see some of these coaching companies going out and suggesting that. Go out, buy your second shot, man. We need to get you in your second. We need to get you in your second. We need to get you in your second. Now, I'm going to tell you, years ago, and I don't know if it's true or not, but Dutch always used to complain. He would say, these coaching companies are trying to keep themselves in business. They're trying to make sure they put some of these shops in hard spots so they always have to have them. The problem is is that they would grow their shop outside of what that coaching company could accomplish, right? And so it was like, okay, this is working beautifully. I don't need to do anything else. It's making money. I don't need the coach anymore. And so the coach would go out and make suggestions, and there was intent behind it to get them to where they had to continue to use the coaching services. Is it true? I don't know. But, but it does make you wonder about some of them. Well, it, it sounds like, and you know, Dutch, God bless him. Um, <laughs> it, it sounds a little tinfoil hat to me. Like I can't imagine doing that, but yeah, yeah, I sure. could, I could, I could also see where some of them might be doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. um, like my daughter would say, she'd come in and be like, dad, I got a conspiracy theory for you. So I don't, I don't know. That's very interesting. There, he had he had some data that that led him to believe that and had seen some things. One hundred percent happening. That's not conspiracy. Anything. That's one hundred percent happening. It makes were, sense Look, from a from a business aspect. You cannot grow these shops and get them humming. And then like what? What am I going to do? So you got to have other offerings. So all of a sudden you're like, hey, I have an entire suite for just sh- uh, service advisors. Because now you're not in the shop, so let us do the training for you for your staff. Oh, we have an entire thing for technicians now because we want to be able to train up your technicians. So now you got to keep you got to keep paying us because now we have the entire thing for your technicians. You don't have to do shit. You can just sit back and collect your cash and just keep paying us, and we'll do everything for you. <laughs> I love Chris's facial expressions when you get going. <laughs> well, that that's <laughs> fine, but I w- I will tell you, it's just not exactly that is not how. Auto fix, auto shop coaching operates at all. Like our, you can go out. We have a great video from a client a month ago, testimonial. Like I get clients to a point, and we fire them. Like we're like we we have taken you as far as we can take you. Yeah. Go out in the world and go do something else. Like I tell people, like our point is um is is to get you to where you can run your shop on your own, and you don't need us anymore. There's there's a stupid commercial, and I can't remember. I probably don't want to know. There's like a dating app that says we're the app that's meant to be deleted. Um, and not anymore, buddy. Not anymore. <laughs> so not anymore. I, and so that you know, old, old commercial I've, like 2010. It, if no, I think that I think it's the last year or two. I'll I'll look it up. Um, but. Uh, well, and I, you know, I've been involved with some of the bigger coaching companies, so I know some of the stuff that goes back and that's why I started my own, but definitely that's not how we think. Like we're not, um, you know, that's because of, Chris, that's because you somehow find all these shops that don't do inspections. <laughs> they don't, they don't articulate anything that they're they, doing. They're deleting they find, recommendations. They, they find me and there's going to be a, <laughs> there's going to be a group of them out there that listen to this. And they're like, oh, I can't believe I've been doing this forever. And they're going to reach out or reach out to you guys or something. Um, uh, there, There's no shortage of shops that need help. And sometimes I wish the coaching companies would cooperate a little bit more amongst themselves. Yeah. Because if everybody raised their hand and said, I need help, we don't have enough coaches in the industry to help For everybody. Sure. For sure. Um, and one of the struggles coaching is, you know, we have a good – not even 20%, like maybe 7% of the industry that uses coaching and peer groups and things like that. So you have 93% of shops out there that have no guidance whatsoever. And they're just like floating along and they can't figure out how they make it. Um, You know, I have a great case study that's getting ready to come out on a shop in Virginia beach. We've basically doubled their sales in six months just by doing the things we know needs done. Car counts barely changed, but doing an inspection, making recommendations and selling, it works. Like like all of these things work. There's no mystery. There's no there's no magic nothing to our industry. If you just do the things right that everybody knows to do and follow up on it, you have a great business. Sure. Anyway. No, I mean you're right. And and you know what? I have I have seen firsthand in some coaching companies. That, that drug the people along, 
right? And they weren't listening, and they weren't taking action. They weren't changing anything. And and some of those coaches would openly say, "Oh no, if they do that, I'm they're out of here. I don't I don't keep them in here if they do." But then you would watch them, and they would stay there for months on months well, yeah, on months because they're because they're, they're paying every month, yeah. Yeah, and they're paying this bill, and they're like, oh, no, they're, they're just improving on their own time. No, no, if, 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 because at that point, to me, that's like theft. And, and right. I've said before, it's, it's like somebody dropping their car off at the shop and me charging them storage, and they say, well, I could come get it, but, you know, if you're okay with it sitting there, it'll just sit there. Uh, why would I do that? Right? Like that, to me, that's taking money from someone. If I'm not providing a service, and I, you know, David talks about the podcast all the time, and he says, look, if we're going to have sponsors, I want to make sure I'm providing value beyond anything you could ever imagine. Right. What's well, the same thing for me with my shop? Like I take pride in the fact that I, I provide more value than I cost. Right. Right. And, and I, I think that those coaching companies give all the other coaches a bad name. Now there's a group of you that are doing a really good job that are really solid people. And Thank it's you. about like, Hey, that connection of like, Hey, this is a good fit for us. Right. And that's what it's all about. Hey, does this person align with you? Does this person align with your beliefs? Does this person, can you talk to them? Do you, does their voice annoy you? Right. Right. Yeah. And and if you can work with that person and it fits, then by all means work with them. Yeah. But if they would, don't and they can pass you to somebody else. I would never hire David. His voice annoys me. But anyway. Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> me too. That's why we're friends. Right, that's why we're friends. That doesn't at this make right. any sense. Why would, would my voice annoys you, but we're friends? Yes, that's <laughs> the only reason we're still friends. Is you keep me grounded, David. You keep me yeah. in here. You know. So my wife made friends with somebody, and oh, no. the husband. These are nice people. They're very nice people. But here's the thing: the husband's a hugger. He's a hugger oh. and a handshaker. <laughs> so, the, like the first time we meet, I get it. Like you stick your hand out, you shake. I go wash my hands immediately after because I know what you've been doing with that hand. So I don't want to be, you know, whatever. Anyway, so I, I I get it. But the second time, why are you shaking my hand? The third time, the fourth time, this is now weird. Like your Andy, he's like half hugging. He's like, oh. Ah half hug and hand shaking like it, lucas like i don't walk up to you and shake your hand every single time we see each other that's weird like that's weird does it does he do that to your wife yes no he half hugs oh. he's like hey oh. half hug because she's female tap, tap, i'm tap. a dude yeah like the half hug side hug and All like right. he's patting her and I'm, why are you doing that and my wife's like oh he's a hugger uh what what is that no <laughs> No, I say these people are incompatible with us. You need to eat them. They're like, they cannot be around me. I'm like, you want to hang out with them? Fine, I get it. You know, you want you want to have friends or whatever without it. No, fine. But no, I like. You know, you know what I'm going to start doing if somebody wants to like, hey, hey, I want these people to be a friend circle. Okay, great. I'm going to show them my meme list. So I'm going to like go down and I'm like, hey, what do you think of this Please meme? Do and that. then they're going to go, ha ha. And then I'm going to go, okay, okay. Bloop, I'll send them the next one and I'll just keep getting danker and danker until they get like really weird, really weird. The funny, really funny ones. And then I want to see how they react. And then you're if they get cold they and moldy, hang, is, what's that? Is, you're going to get cold and moldy. You know, in <laughs> pot culture, they always called pot <laughs> dank. And, and like the, the senior citizens in the room would always look at it and say, it's dank. <laughs> it's, it's cold, moldy. It smells. <laughs> what's the point of that? You know, so like David and his dank memes. <laughs> this is <laughs> devolved. This is devolved like way down. Like, I don't even know. Like, I don't. Um, I don't know how to deal with this guy. He's like, he's nice. I don't I want think, to be I rude to him. My wife's like, you're being rude. Not I need count. Oh, is that what it is? I I, I need coaching or counseling. And so I, I'm just like, I, I'm telling her, like, I don't know what to do with this guy. She's so, like, just be nice. I'm like, I can't. He wants to touch me. I don't want to touch him. I don't want. <laughs> what? I don't need to be touched. What like you need? To me. <laughs> what you need to do is just tell him. Say, excuse me, sir. I have a bubble, and you're in it. Please step back. <laughs> like, like if you get he's if like, you if you get in my bubble again, I will punch you in the throat. I'm sorry, no, I'm just giving you this warning. Oh, he's really hey, big. Yeah, now I don't. I don't know physically. He's very large and imposing. He's. He's probably 80% of Brian Pollock's size. 
he that's a he's a big boy. Yeah, so, David's not gonna say that to this so guy. I'm not gonna yeah, him. I'm not gonna try to get into a fight. Th- this, with this is guy. the guy that David actually shakes his hand while they're standing at the urinal, right? Like that's when this actually yeah. happens. So now, so you're telling think, me though, if we get into something, I think I can hang because I think he's just physically like he'll throw his back out if he tries to swing a punch. Like, so very good shape. <laughs> So, do you guys know who Burt Kreischer is? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, have you ever heard the story about the bear? Yeah, every, yeah everybody. Has. So you need to you need to look it up. So he's, all he's I can a comedian with one joke. Uh, it's uh, no, one joke. <laughs> no, no. This is a well. He. I mean, it's a pretty good joke. I mean, but anyway, if you haven't seen it or heard it, you need to go out because all I can envision now is David with <laughs> with this bear. And this bear is going, huh, huh, but you have to watch the video to figure that out. So I'll, yeah, David I'll send has a it bear. to you. His, like, name, his name's Jeff Compton. Um, you know, uh, that's just how we roll. <laughs> so I don't even know. I don't even know how we got here again, but here we are. Right. So I can um, see Jeff Compton is cuddly. He's a cuddly bear. It's yeah. He needs to get out of Canada. And, you know, he comes down to KC. We have a very eclectic community down here. And they they embrace those. They love they love the, David Roman's done the, with care auto repair or done with auto repair. I, <laughs> we are we are friendly to that community. Let me tell you, we are very friendly. Hey, we got the know, bathroom and everything for it. We're, we're set up. We're good. I love it. I love it. Ah. <sighs> Chris, I don't even know what to say at this point. I don't even know what to do or how to move. Like this is this is interesting. So, um, uh, I will say tires, one thing. Let's, I, I, let's, hey, I'm going to roll that out. I'm 100. percent Like I'm going to come up with a with a tire hazard thing. We're going to push that hard. We're going to see if I can I improve my tire sales. I'm going to tell everybody, and, and we're just going to mark up our tires and then sell free. Like we're just going to roll it in. So it'll That's be what free, I did for the road time. hazard, uh, you know, within 25 miles, we'll tow you back to the shop. We'll do whatever. Like I do that already for my customers, but I'm just going to advertise the crap out of it. I'm going to jack up, like tack 25 bucks a tire or whatever with free road hazard. I'm going to sell a slightly better tire. I'm going to eat flats, free flats for life. And once a year we will rotate and uh, rotate the tire and maybe we'll do a free alignment check once a year or whatever. So the tires stay nice. For freezies for life. So for life. J- just make the money on it. You deserve it. Keep it. Do what you can. But again, everybody out there, the big thing is, is just make sure that you're working these programs. Like you can make a lot of money on these yeah. programs if you work them. And as long as your technicians are writing up tires, like I- I'm a big uh, Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. Like, so walk through the shop and see all the cars that should be written up on tires you're that should be red. You're going to buy a little red. TB400. Isn't that what the part number is? Isn't that part the part number, Lucas? The Alltail? Yeah. 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 I Just think buy, so. buy them but, all little TB four hundreds. They gotta zap the tire and take a picture of it. Right. I, look, I'm I'm just going to tell you that that I think that walking and doing a double check on the evaluations from time to time is huge, and and it's process creep. That's something that I've experienced in my shop right. terribly. Is that that we get a process, and and unfortunately for us, it went in a way that you would never expect it to go. It was that they were putting in sufficient detail, and it was clear and it was concise before. And they, they creeped in the direction of more detail, more detail, more detail, more detail, because they were always trying to cover something that we had this one instance where this one thing happened and we didn't tell them about it, right? And so they got to the point that they were putting so much detail, it was taking too much time. So you can find things on either side of the process, either to make the process more efficient or in the other sense, maybe you're not making the process more efficient. You're finding things that, that should have been on that ticket that weren't on that ticket. And, and, you know, look, even if you, if you don't even consider it as a sales opportunity, you consider it as a legal protection that you make sure you told them about something that, that can be the difference between winning or losing a major settlement in court. Right. And, right. and trust me, I've been watching these court videos. You don't, you do <laughs> not want one of those major settlements in the wrong way. You don't want to be on the wrong end of that sucker. You want right. that judge to look at it and say, I can see exactly what they said here. This makes sense. Right. So there's a great product out there. I think they've changed their name, 
but it's basically like a palm size scanner that if your service advisors can do a walk around, start at the left front tire and you reach down and scan the tires, it'll do tread depth and it'll give you red, green, yellow. And it also tell you if based on the tire um, wear, if it's uh, out of alignment and yeah. you just go through and it, you can either print it out or it'll add it to your DVI. Um so it's it's a great thing. I've got a shop in Pensacola, Florida that they used to sell no tires and now they do about 75 to 100 a week um, wow. based on on what they're doing, just like putting the process and procedure in place. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is Asta for a minute. Um, uh, I really wish like just for me, like you don't have to do it for anybody else. I wish we could get that week changed because it's it falls on a bad week for me. And the last time I was there was the year we had the tropical storm, whatever oh, that yeah. was. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, I have a peer group meeting that same weekend every year, but every third or fourth year, it's like I can catch up and make it. So I, that was the last time I was there. And that's have one thing. Group at, that's at what I was getting ASDA. ready to say. Like, this seems like a great expo. opportunity. There's room. There's lots of room. The... I don't know. This peer group, the peer group has been meeting since 1990. Like this is like one of the, probably the oldest independent auto repair peer group in the country. Um, and they're very set in their ways. It's a great group, but um, uh, we travel all the time. So anyway, uh, if you're not signed up for ASTA, formerly ST, sign up, go. Um, the last time I was there, I did a class, but it wasn't tire related. And I really feel like somebody needs to come do a tire shop class geared towards sure. selling tires, road hazard, and all that. So I will try to make the commitment to be there next year and teach that class. I'll submit it and whatever. Um, and I'll I just got to figure. I just got to figure out how to make that work because I'm, um, you know, as the ASCA, it seems pretty straightforward to me. There we go. Maybe we can create another one. Just start one and then do that or something. Um, but like, as Ron White says, but I'm only one man, right? So I can only <laughs> do so much. I can't, I can't eat all the cows, but um, no, you guys are going to have a great time this year for sure. Yep. It's going to be a blast, man. It's going to be huge. Yeah. And um, I, I was just looking through some of the classes and some of the opportunities to do some of the fun stuff. Kim and Brian and the Institute stepped up big to do the go-kart thing again. So really yep. excited about that. That's going to be a blast. Um, and we're going to be there recording. So it should be phenomenal. So excited. Hey, hate you're not going to be there, but sounds like you'll be somewhere sunny and warm and nice. And we'll, we'll be in Traverse City, Michigan. Oh. So, yeah, <laughs> it, it, that? I think it's I, I think it'll be nice there. You know, this is like late September, so it'll be good. But then so Kimberly and I are going on a road trip after that in our van. We're going to go up through Canada, up into Maine and then come down the um, East Coast visiting shops. So we're going to do nice. like 12 shop visits in three weeks and then like, just make like a huge loop from Colorado um all the way up around back through Texas to see our daughter and then back home. So nice. Um, look for us on the road. We'll be hitting the, hitting the East coast there. Fantastic. Brother. Can't wait to see yeah. you soon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, this is a weird thing. I've never met either one of you in person and I know we've been at events at the same time. We have absolutely met. You don't. Oh, I see. I'm just not memorable. That's all right. That's all right. Like I thought it was just a David thing, but that's all right. I'll remember this. If you, I'll remember if this, you can, Chris. If you came up and hugged me and whispered in my ear like David would, or this other guy, then maybe I would remember you. When, when did we meet? The only place. Tell me. We. I think you're lying. Meet, by the way, we no. either met. At, we either met no. at STX or we met at uh, a ratchet. I want to say it was an STX meeting, but it may have been Ratchet and Wrench. I can't remember. There was a big. Pool. I've, I've never been to Ratchet. I've never been to Ratchet and Wrench because I don't like Ratchet and Wrench, but that's a whole nother podcast. At STX in Orlando, you were there, right? I was, I was there, but I don't remember meeting yep. you. Yep. No, we walked outside the bar. You walked right down the little stairs where the bar was. Remember, they had the outside bar, and it was over top of the oh, pool. I remember this. Uh, Chris and Craig were there, and we sat out like on one of the the little patios right on oh. top of it. And yeah. that was where the lady fell and cracked her head and the other yeah, girl was dude. up hugging her. Okay. I remember yep. that, but I don't remember the first part. I see, see, I told you I'm not memorable. That's okay. I don't remember well, that. I, think, okay. I think <laughs> that okay. I, I think that other experience scarred me 
um, yeah. and wipe that from my memory. But okay, I'll agree. Hey, I, I am, you know, I will admit when I screw up and obviously I screwed up, but that was the, that was the strangest, weirdest thing that's ever happened. I think at a, at yeah, a thing, it was pretty we're, weird. we're all out there talking, enjoying the sunshine in Orlando in February. Um, and this, I, I, she could be some technician's wife, shop owner's wife. I don't even know who she was. She was so drunk. She slipped and fell. And like, then this other lady came up and like had her legs wrapped around her and was hugging her and telling her it's okay. And we're trying to get people to make sure it was like one of the oddest things I've ever seen. It was, it was, a t- now, you know why I forgot Lucas. I'm sorry. Yeah, like if yeah, you, it was intense. if, if you meet me or if, when we meet again without that going on, I'll be fine. Sorry. I okay. apologize. All right. My, All right, my, my deepest regrets on that one. <laughs> so, um, people, it's not good for you. Yeah. And, and I will say, you said I was at the bar. I don't, I've been sober for 30 plus years. So, no, no, no. So I wasn't saying you I'm, were at the bar. I might have we been outside right below okay. the bar. All right. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. You, you weren't at the bar. You weren't at the bar. David doesn't drink either, but one day they're going to find him after a few drinks, uh, face down in a pool. But, uh, no. that's how he rest that's how he rest people that's how he rest so okay All well right. i don't know if we did any good hopefully people understand something out of this and um we'll go okay i'll see and so i don't know why we waited this long too shame on you guys <laughs>